Hey folks, David Stewart here. We are doing it live. Do the uh, live right. So we're going to pick it up from where I started on Wednesday. We planned a new um, we planned a new story. Now we're just going to continue and write it just like we did before. I might cross post um, the copies of it on to Kindle Vela, even though like no one uses Kindle Vela. Sometimes Amazon gives you like a bonus for using it. So just an opportunity for a couple extra dollars, right? Uh, but if you are a Patreon member or a member of Ko-Fi or whatever, or Substack even, um, then you'll get free copies of that. I think I even can do it on YouTube. It's just anything longer than like a thousand word post, YouTube just won't post it for some reason. So I have to like put it into comments <laughs> for people to read it. It's a little weird. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's what we're doing. Nice to have you there. Nice to have you here, Kai. We are going to get into... Um, we're going to get right into it here, I think. Might bring down the music a little bit. Uh, yeah. And I might do a live music stream after this. We'll see. We'll see how I feel about things. Where is it? I think it was calling it Prince of Twilight tentatively. I think I'm going to call it uh, like Oracle of Twilight to like reference the witch towards the end of the story. Um, let's take a look at it. All right, here it is. this over just a bit okay how do I improve my writing practice I'm told to read the classics but I feel like I barely have time to read even less to write well if you don't have time to read you don't have time to write so tackle that challenge first uh, let me give you a couple pieces of advice for tackling the challenge of I don't have time to read uh, you chances are you actually have a crap ton of time to read you just aren't used to thinking of reading in the way that you do the other things that you do in life, right? So I'm gonna think of like a typical person. Like I'm gonna imagine you're like a Zoomer. You got your phone, you got social media, you look at stuff a lot. Chances are you're actually reading all day long already. But what you're reading are like tweets and little Facebook posts or or and looking at short form content. You're not doing any like deep reading. So just put the Kindle app on your phone. And when you're bored, instead of playing a game, read part of a book and just read it in one to two minute snippets. When you use the bathroom, read the book. When you're bored in line, read the book, right? So just use the use your habits that you already have. Just direct them towards things that you enjoy more, honestly. <clears throat> this is something that you have to think about and I think about it sometimes with like social media I guess in general it's like if it's not enjoyable don't use it right I barely use Facebook because there's just nothing on it for me so if you're if you're opening up social media to get that dopamine hit or just to avoid a few seconds of boredom right that's a whole nother discussion about that it's okay to have boredom right uh, you know you gotta <laughs> You gotta be okay with some boredom, right? Um, just use that device you have to read books and articles and the things that matter to you. Um, the other problem is, what are the classics? The classics are different depending on who you ask. And I think a lot of people are trained to hate reading by reading what English teachers think are the classics. And in most cases, that just involves um, modernist literature. That's what they think the classics are. Not really classics, but modernist literature. The real classics, if we're talking about the real classics, not what your English teacher thinks is classics, those are gonna be the Iliad, the Odyssey, it's gonna be like various Greek tragedies, it's gonna be like Xenophon, it's gonna be uh, you know uh, the Aeneid by Virgil, um, all the way up through a lot of early medieval stuff, even uh, Boethius, right? There's so much that's the classics, which, uh, you know, Metamorphosis by Ovid. All of these things are older and deeper. And the Bible. <laughs> you can read the Bible too. Um, I think the Bible's in a different category, but there's a lot of depth to it. 
versus reading um, Ernest Hemingway. It's nothing bad against Ernest Hemingway, but chances are uh, kids who were pretty into reading, I shouldn't say chances are, I knew kids that were pretty into reading until they had to read John Steinbeck and, um, and Ernest Hemingway in like the ninth grade. Where it's like, oh, ninth and 10th grade, you gotta read like Of Mice and Men, the most depressing nihilist uh, piece of fiction John Steinbeck ever wrote. Rather than something like The Grapes of Wrath, which while it's propagandistic to an extent, um, there's, it's not like completely nihilist. It's not like meaningless modernist stuff. So modernism, I think, uh, you know, modernism is a very popular trend for a hundred years now in the academic institutions. And so if you are letting them color your ideas of classics, you're actually going to miss the stuff that's really classic. You know, you really should be reading stuff like uh, mythology if you want to be reading cl uh, classics, the stuff that's like the deep level of where our culture and our hearts really come from. And here's classics that almost nobody reads. Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Those texts are foundational to popular literature and foundation to science, foundational to science fiction and fantasy writing. But you'll never see them assigned to you in school. And they're great. So read those, right? You can read Dostoevsky. I like it. It's fine, right? You know. But if, you, if you're a person who's like, I really want to write science fiction or fantasy or genre fiction, you should probably be looking at Edgar Rice Burroughs a lot more than you're looking at John Steinbeck, right? And the thing is, I don't know a single person who just bought John Steinbeck books. <laughs> they had them because they were required to read them for a class. So whether he would be popular without that support or not, I don't know. But Edgar Rice Burroughs certainly is and was, and his stuff continues to be adapted 100 years later. So, you know. Anyway, that's my advice on reading. Like, use the technology to your advantage to read. The other thing is use audiobooks. I don't think they count exactly like reading. They don't have the same effect for me, but it's a great way to get a lot of input for things, to hear um, what other authors are doing. Just uh, grab some audiobooks. I have free audiobooks on my channel of my books, uh, so you can listen to those or whatever. Um, there's plenty of free audiobooks out there, actually, on YouTube and elsewhere. Uh, of the classics, including Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, in fact, I should do a review of it. There is a free version of Bram Stoker's Dracula available on Audible if you have, I believe if you just have a Amazon Prime account, which a lot of people do. So it's a great version. If you've never read Dracula, go listen to that audiobook and just put it on when you're doing some other task, washing dishes or mowing the lawn or working, something where you're not mentally intensely engaged in the task and you'll find it's a really enjoyable experience. Dracula to me is a classic, but I've never seen it included in any kind of uh, like academic curriculum. Um, Princess of Mars is a classic, never seen it in, even discussed. I didn't know who Edgar Rice Burroughs was until well after I'd even, like I never saw it even through the end of graduate school. No, no mention of him. It's like he didn't exist. But probably the most important writer of the 20th century, even though he's like 19th to 20th century probably the most important writer, Edgar Rice Burroughs. More important than Tolkien, to be honest. Tolkien's very popular, but as far as what created the foundational depth of our genre fiction, it's Edgar Rice Burroughs. I've got to be honest. Um, you could read Lord Dunsany. It's all free. Like All the classic stuff is free, so just open it up on a web page on your phone. And to that extent, you know, you should be reading like the, the Summa Theologica. You should be reading Beowulf. You should be reading Canterbury Tales. You should be reading philosophical texts too, because those are um, those are important as well. You know, so that's how you improve your reading. Now, how do you improve your writing? It's the same idea. You just got to practice. Um, you just got to do it. So sit down and do it. Try to write five hundred words a day. See how far you can get. See how long it takes you to get to the million words of crappy writing that you have to get out of your system before you start to be good at this at this game. You know, so it's just practice. That's how you develop. I'm actually 36, but just spot on. I keep doing that nonstop deluge of super short content, mostly Discord. Yeah, um, I don't. I, I need to probably 
take down the Discord server that's attached to like um, the Patreon stuff. I barely have time to interact with Discord. I don't like it as a platform very much. Uh, and I prefer if I'm going to spend time like on social media for it to be pretty wide open so that I can get more opinions versus like a little um, club discussions. I'm not 21 anymore. I, I don't have time to like spend on on message boards or things like that it's just uh, my time is so short especially right now we had a major um you know we had a major weather event and so my house is going to be completely we we had a lot of damage to our house um so i don't even know how i'm going to schedule content over the next few weeks it's going to be uh really really tough to do anything um, over the next month, maybe two months. I have no idea. My life will be completely upended because of all the damage that happened in my house. So anyway, yeah, I'll figure it out. Maybe just shoot more stuff with my phone. Go out of the garage and turn on the phone. Um, I haven't been able to accomplish any meaningful writing since the start of January. Just sit down every day to do it. It's like saying I haven't gone to the gym. Just go. You have to like make yourself go on day one. The hardest day is always like the first day back. So yeah, just make yourself go back. I have Dracula, I have the Count of Monte Cristo or the two on my shelf uh, and books from various YouTube actually. Yeah, so you can listen to the audiobook for free. That's a really convenient way to, to take it in and it works really well actually because it's all done in second person. It's all letters and things like that. So it works pretty well and diaries, diary stuff. I went through a phase reading Jane Austen novels. As, as a man, I was quite entertained. It really helped me understand female characters. I really intensely dislike Jane Austen novels personally. I was forced to read them in various literature classes. Um, they are the foundation of Chicklet, though. So you will get that perspective. And so I can enjoy them on a certain level of like understanding part of a market segment historically and like the origins of, of corporate genre fiction before it was like really went overground with pulp in the early 20th century. So there's there's something to that, you know, um, but I don't enjoy reading them really. So anyway, that's my advice. All right, let's take a look at this document here. All right, we're going to chapter two. Alfred escapes with the help of his friend Avelready, who comes upon the carriage by accident. So let's hit it. I'm thinking Adel Reddy's got to do kind of a, a Don Quixote style rescue where it's uh, unintentionally like he unintentionally is successful if that makes any sense he'll go through try to do something brave and daring and it's a failure but it somehow works on accident because of like some uh, you know, some random event that allows it to allows it to work. So uh, that's what I'm thinking for this one. striking the iron.
are welcome. I need to slide over here a little bit in a more comfortable riding position. Jailer. document 
Bissara is the name of the town. Okay. Nice to catch a stream. Do you have a system for coming up with names, or is it just something on the spot that sounds good? A lot of times, something that's on the spot that sounds good. For this one, they're all English names from the Middle Ages. Alfred, Adelred, which is Alfred's older brother, Alfred the Great's older brother, Edward, right? Um, Gwendolyn, uh, Bartholomew. These are all like Germanic and Saxon names from like the, the Middle Ages. So you just use those. It's fine. I like the name Alfred. Um, I like A's, Alfred. Uh, Alfred has a good noble sound to it. Um, I'm the same way but with outfits. Outside of one or two details of face, I barely have an idea what they look like. It's actually not important, uh, especially if you are listening to someone like um, Elmore Leonard. You don't need to be really verbose with character descriptions. Uh, you just, you know. It's just not that important. The character lives as who they are. It's not. It's not really important, like exactly how long their hair is, um, or like exactly what shade of it, or you know things like that. You don't need to mention every detail of a character. Um, you really don't. It's who they are. It's the way they talk that gives them their existence. Not like that they have brown hair or black hair. You know that I talk about it sometimes because characters are contrast with each other, right? Like if you have a character from like. The North, <laughs> you know, from Scandinavia, he might have blonde hair and he's in Italy and they have dark hair there, right? Or a collection of different colors of hair, but usually not bright blonde, you know what I mean? Um, so, that's it. starting to bug me again. I had like some uh, blepharitis on my right eye, my right eyelid. Yeah.
What was the name of the tower? Tower of Dusk, that's right. chat i got stuck after finishing the very first draft of the first act of my story i had only written a very rough and general outline describing events in broad strokes and decided i needed to write a more detailed outline before actually continuing writing got stuck trying to figure out some of the details would it be better to just ditch the detailed outline for now i don't know you could try it um usually most people get stuck because they don't know what happens next so it's like i can't work out the details it's like well you need to work those details out at some point so it's probably better to think of them now rather than um, later on. Okay. 
that's that's my thought. So, yeah. Probably better to work them out now rather than trying to wait till later on to do it. It's April 14th here where I live. Oh, wow. Yeah. You will have it at the tower. What's this guy's name? It was such a good name. Musil.
You spell weevils. Weevils. He's not gritting his teeth. Right. Now, what we need to happen here is uh, we are going to have um, we're going to have uh, Adel ready. Adel Red show up. And so he'll uh, he'll basically attempt to save Alfred and kind of fail. But it'll be a funny kind of failure that actually ends up working. light off starting to bug me kind of fun that I can just like put on a YouTube channel of me playing music you know 
and it's just on you know it's like me watching myself this is an old one because my desk was 90 degrees away it was on this wall when I recorded this I think Kind of interesting. Just this one. Oh, this is the best of 2023. This is a long, this is a long playlist. Best of package I need another name, a new name for the other guy that's with him. That's a fun name. How long have you been riding? I'm 40, so 34 years, probably 35 years. <laughs> I don't know, writing books. Started publishing books in 2016, I think. And I was writing for a long time before that. Okay. 
need a name. Let me think of a good name. Let me give him like a... Wadden. <laughs> a wadden chest. A wooden chest. What advice would you give to a new rider, someone just starting out? Practice. Practice. Do it. Just do it. I have a whole book on how to set up your creative process. What's more important than any other thing is just doing the work. Being able to turn on your computer, or your word processor, being able to sit down even with a piece of paper and just do the work every day. Most people fail or most people really fail as writers because they don't do the work because they're just unwilling to practice. Um, rather than because they don't understand fundamental techniques about storytelling. If you read a lot and you write a lot, you're going to pick up on those things and you're going to have those ideas and know how to use them without having to listen to people like me and or on about them. Um, but the truth is, if you're not really willing to make time for the practice part of it, um, then you actually won't improve what you're doing. So you just have to pick a time. Just pick a time, make it yours, and do as much as you can in that time that you pick. Just like how you pick a time to maybe go to the gym or a time to eat dinner. 
you pick a time to work on your craft and just work consistently on it and that's how you're going to get better that will do more work for you than any class uh, any lecture anything like that um, i knew so many uh you know literature majors let's say um, when i was at the university and when i taught at the university too i knew so many literature majors that would talk about wanting to write a book and they would never write one they would never finish one they would write a couple chapters maybe and they would stop uh they would lose heart they just couldn't get it done and the reason was they just weren't motivated to do it they i think they just didn't really want to be writers they they liked the idea of being an author but they didn't like doing the work of writing a book whereas you really have to enjoy the process and you have to you'll enjoy the process more if you have a have a handle on it and it feels easy and it feels natural and good and you're making progress towards your goals nothing feels better than being able to like finish your goal and finish a book so yeah just work on it every day um, the people that i noticed that i've known over the years who weren't able to do that they're the people that you know they can they can write all of the literature analysis papers they can write half a million words in their uh, literature degree analyzing other works of fiction but they can't finish a book of their own they're just not working on it that's all uh, they're not really willing to make even a minimal sacrifice when you get down to it they just don't really want to do it and that's okay like there's honestly no judgment some people like the idea of a thing more than the thing itself uh, i remember just reading about um uh, devin townsend and he got a gig with steve Vai, and it completely disillusioned him he's like oh man like i thought the music business was something completely different than what it was and it just changed his perspective it's like it turns out i didn't like being a rock star <laughs> this wasn't what i wanted you know kind of interesting what, in your opinion, are the most important elements of good writing? Knowing, knowing publishers. <laughs> to, to get your stuff on store shelves. <laughs> um, you know, being, being high on the progressive stack. So being, if you're a, if you're a black female trans, then that's the most important element of your writing. <laughs> it's true though like you're you're gonna get a lot more opportunities um if you can tie yourself to some quote marginalized group than if you're you'll ever get just having high quality writing you know that's sad uh if we're going to be really serious it's mostly um being able to pace and structure a story correctly and know what should be in the story and what shouldn't be in the story that's actually very challenging but it's the difference between a boring book and an exciting book and it's the difference between a uh, a book which you close and a book which stays open till you finish it's knowing how to pace it and knowing what needs to be in it and what stuff to cut out um, that makes a big difference style i don't think is in, is as important um, as a lot of people seem to think um, you know there's writers who i think have absolutely terrible style almost unreadable and they're still popular so i think the elements of the story and having characters and knowing how to write them i think that at the end of the day ends up being more important than uh having a special mastery over style so let's put it that way okay All right, let's see here.
relaxing. Now here's a here's a thing, right? Is that he gets he gets caught at dusk, right? So I actually need to rethink some of the the timeline that I have here. What's the most surprising thing you discovered while writing your books? I don't know. <laughs> Affler, Alfred, Alfred. There we go. All right, so they're already in dusk. Let's let's redo this. So. Um. Yeah. Okay. Cause I had this in day. Let's have them like drive all night. There's no sunlight, right? Yeah. Let's pull this out here. Um. pale remnant of dusk.
When you were first publishing a book, what was the journey like and the things one can learn from it? How many unpublished and half-finished books do you have? I don't know. I publish most things, but there's things I hold on to for a while sometimes. I don't know off the top of my head any of that. Um, at least one, King Leper, will probably be out this year. Bro needs a chat bot to read <laughs> replies in the chat.
let's, let's shorten this up. He wouldn't say all this. finish this little chapter out. How long is it already? 1500 words. All right, that's a, it's okay. It'll be a, it'll be a slightly longer chapter. a word like he flopped about. There we go.
see.
I'm gonna, I forgot I had to have him eat the food. Need a name for the horse.
poisoned your own mother? What's your writing desk set up? I have a monitor, big monitor. I have my sound monitors. My sound interface is over here, right? MIDI keyboard, I got an Appleton push. I have a Ducky keyboard right here and a mouse, not much to it. I have an L-shaped desk. So the L-shaped desk is to carry all the other musical equipment that I use for other stuff. So um, yeah, that's that. It's a 4K monitor, so it's like having four HD monitors, pretty simple. I do like it. Are you sure? Hmm. I wouldn't say everyone likes me. We gotta figure out the name of the girl's father. What is, uh, what is her name? Let's see. Does her father have a name? Her name is Gwendolyn. No, Gwendolyn is Alfred's mother, Victoria. Yeah.
do a little Jar Jar, Jar Jar Binks thing. It's like, yes, you know, I'm sort of uh, an outcast, you know. So we'll we'll fill that in next chapter of like why he's, uh, you know, more to his character, like he's a Don Quixote like character that he he did something really foolish at a party. I'm gonna I'm gonna my thought is that he would have like rom not romanced Victoria but romanced like a married woman like uh, attempted to have some sort of tryst with one and I think that would be a really fun a really f a fun way to explore that and uh, Victoria will not like him as a result as well it's like Victoria's sister or something like that so we'll do that in the next setup. That's good for today. Next one is going to be chapter three. Okay, so how long was chapter two? How much did we write today? 20, 2,400 words. All right, that's a that's a decent length for this little action chapter. Chapter three, we can go back to our outline, remind ourselves of what we're doing. Okay, so yeah, uh, we had this inciting incident. Um, so this is going to be transition one after they escape 
uh, you know, they find their way to a rural castle where they meet Victoria, who helps them not because she knows Alfred is king, but because she thinks they're convicts and is excited by the prospect of adventure. So I might make them not talk to the Lord because they see it's like castle soldiers or something there, right? Um, so they'll kind of sneak around um, and try to figure stuff out and run into Victoria and the stables who demands to come with them, you know. And I have a thing with like Alfred's father's sword. Yeah. Uh, I may rework this. This is some of these details. Right, like these little details, I may rework those. Um, this might be just like a, a thing where it's like she believes in something kind of stupid. And that'll be the extent of it. So anyway, that's going to be it for today for this. Let me answer any more questions that we have going on right here. From Rinku. Um, what's the most surprising thing? I can't think of anything. Uh... Well, when you're first publishing a book, what was the journey like? It was a lot of learning. You got to do a lot of learning about a lot of things. So if you're just, if you enjoy learning, then it's a lot of fun. If you're not energized by that, then not so much. Uh, what are common traps for aspiring writers? Being aspiring is one of those traps. That is to think of yourself as somebody who can't do something yet. You should think of yourself as a developing writer at worst, right? And developing meaning like I'm still learning how to be good but you're writing, so you're a writer. So don't aspire to write, just write, okay? That's an easy trap to fall into, as well as um, getting disheartened when you write something that sucks. First time you do something, it's always gonna suck, so just embrace that and live with it. How do you find stories? Is it the setting, a character's journey, an image? How does your creative process start? So I did that in the planning, um, in the planning one the week before last, I guess. I plan this whole story so um, I just start with an idea for what it could be any of those it could be I want to explore a setting it could be I have an idea for a character I have an idea for a plot um, something like that uh, I went through the planning process and that has all that kind of all that kind of detail you could start with any one of those and go through it sometimes I get inspired by like a dream and that has a detail and then I work a story around that yeah so that's uh that's how I do it. You know, it could be anything. Sometimes it's a scene that pops into your head. So like Muramasa was just the first scene. And then the story just kind of materialized after that first scene that I imagined and wrote. Um, a lot of times I'll write, I have a first scene in mind that begins a conflict. And then that will, that will have me writing the rest of the book. Who looks better, Seabum or Vizzers? I'd have to look up Vizzers. Wesley Vizzers. Let's take a look at it. All right, let's take a look. Well, you know, this guy, um, I remember seeing him a couple years ago when he was still developing. And he looks a lot like better now. He looks a lot, this was, it was definitely after 2013, you know. This is a really good classic physique. This is good lighting too. Um, I feel like the lighting on stage can make you look small. Like, he looks so much bigger like Arnold here. Um, he looks good versus Seabun. Uh, Definitely great, great physiques, you know. That lat spread is awesome. Very 70s. Um, I think he doesn't look as good in this pose, even though he's it's a pretty good pose, simply because he doesn't have the narrow waist of some of these guys. So he can do a good vacuum. This kind of twisting, the sort of twisting thing that Arnold would do, it just really accents that lat. I don't know if you guys can see that. It really accents this patissimus dorsi and makes your waist look smaller. This is a really good pose that he does. This still looks good. You know, you can't hide anything on stage in a competition, but um, he looks good, you know? I don't know if he's like, uh, gonna be like the hot ticket this year. So he's definitely like gotten more, 
like better definition for sure like he had a great core physique and he's really like this uh the conditioning he's dialed in it looks like so looks good i haven't kept up with bodybuilding very much though so i feel bad about ramon he looks amazing but he can't beat sebum or visitors yeah, I think on stage they look unhealthy too. It's too dry. You have to think about what they look like live. It looks different live than on a photograph where the light's moving and you have things in motion. Um, but, you know, that's always the, the push is like to get as much water out as possible to increase the definition. It isn't healthy, but that's what they do for competition. So, you know. Yeah. He won both Arnold's this year and might challenge Seabum and Mr. O. Well, he's looking really good. Visitors is looking really good. Um, I This guy was like, uh, I saw him on YouTube a couple years ago. I wouldn't, like, no one knew about this guy. And uh, he had like a great core physique. He looked like Arnold from the 70s, you know. Um, but it looks like just for competition, just getting more, you know, keeping that size and getting really lean. I bet he'll, bet he'll look really good. You know, like this is a really good looking... And this is a good pose. Notice like this line. This line really accentuates like his strongest features. You know, looks good. All right. That'll be about it for today, guys. Thanks so much for coming and hanging out with me. I will see you all next time. I might do a music stream in a couple minutes. So stay tuned for that if you're into that. It's not going to be any talking. It's just going to be me playing guitar for like 30 minutes and keyboards and stuff so this kind of music that's been on in the background we might do a whole thing of that we'll see we'll see how i feel in about 10 minutes so i'll probably do that at least do it for like 30 minutes but i need a little break to drink and recover and have a snack and stuff like that so um yeah because i've gone for almost two hours so that's good we wrote uh how much did we write in that two hours i forgot it was probably pretty good like uh i think 2400 words yeah so 24 2500 words and doing chat, that's pretty good. So you gotta think like if you can do two hours a day, that's 2,500 words a day if you are good and that can produce several books a year, or several long books a year. So anyway guys, take it easy and I'll see you all. Uh, yeah, it's a known fact that a body like on screen gives you attention from other men, not women. It's a guy's thing, it's true, that's true. I don't like such exaggerated bodies on men. Okay, so I'm just gonna address this before I go because I think it's just a fun thing to think about. You see like the bodybuilder on stage and he's like really big and you know, uh, and women are like, oh, I'm not into that. I'm not into that. Well, you know, if you had that body and you weren't like oiled up with tan and like doing those poses and you're just standing around, women think it's super attractive. They're like, oh, it's grotesque when they see all the muscles popping out. But in any kind of natural pose, that's the, like that mu hypermuscular body type. They actually will end up liking and preferring it. Not, maybe not like Mr. Olympia level, but definitely like classic physique level. They don't, they would see that guy and be like, he's in really good shape. They wouldn't think he's a professional bodybuilder until the guy like strips down and starts posing. And then you can see just like how crazy his size is. If you're just standing around relaxed and you have abs and you that may not be enough for a woman to think you're hot but if you have abs and you have like muscle especially big shoulders and chest then that ends up looking good but women yeah they're not into like the you know, you know, straining like popping veins to try to get the you know to get the the strongest look on the on the you know they're not into that and that's true so it's all context. It's all context. If you're in really good shape and very muscular and you're not doing that, the woman will see the body and be like, well, yeah, he's attractive. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. Um, women want, in my experience, a masculine frame, no doubt, which you see on stage with the pros is an enhanced peak. It crosses into the grotesque. I agree. It is grotesque. And I kind of like freaks. Like, that's probably the appeal of it to me. It's like, it's freaks. So keep that in mind. And uh, it just means, like, it's so people are like, I don't want to get too big. Yeah, you're not going to get too big. Trust me. <laughs> you're gonna get too big when you're doing like a, a gram of gear a week then you're probably then you could get too big maybe but probably not uh if you just stay in good shape then that's 
you're not going to get too big. <laughs> it's hard to build muscle. Um, you know, I'm not in great shape right now. I'm definitely carrying a lot of fat. I need to go on a diet. I was looking at myself in the mirror. I'm like, I'm definitely getting chubby. Definitely getting chubby. You've got to doubt that. So, all right, I'll see you guys next time. Have a great one.